The train has finally arrived at the station. After several weeks, five videos now, some inadvertent mistakes and unfortunate parts problem, and more delays than I'd really like to admit to, Project Baron, our $6,000 water cooling monster all AMD system is complete. Let's see how it performs, and almost as importantly, how awesome it's gonna look sitting on my desk. So how did we end up configuring everything? Well, this same 1950X topped out at 3.9 gigahertz for me when I was doing my initial testing with a standard AIO. Under the heat killer block, I had this puppy humming along at 4.2 gigahertz on all cores at 1.4 volts without any issues. However, I backed it off to 4.1 gigahertz at 1.35 volts as this is a more comfortable daily configuration for me. This gave me idle temps around 24 Celsius and max load temps during IDA64 stress testing of 57C. This is absolutely outstanding and well below what can be expected out of a comparable Intel i9. The G-Skill Trident Z had no problems running at 2933, although I did have some instability at 3200. The system would boot just fine, but I experienced a few crashes and didn't want to take a chance, so 2933 it is. 
As with many Vega GPUs, overclocking isn't their strong suit, although I was able to achieve 1710 MHz on the core and 1000 MHz on the HBM before running into constant crashes. However, even with the power target slider cranked all the way to the right, I still couldn't get stable boost frequencies higher than the low 1600s during gaming. Nevertheless, as you guys will see shortly, performance was definitely improved versus the stock cooler. Additionally, the GPU cores didn't get any warmer than the low 40s. With typical gaming loads, seeing temperatures between 39 and 42 Celsius. Phenomenal for any Vega 64. In addition to the parts you guys are familiar with by now, we topped off Project Baron with some finishing touches from Nsource Customs and Addicted PC. Nsource sent over their all new GPU backplate with the BPS Customs logo printed on it and Addicted PC hit me up and wanted to provide one of their new RGB power cords. They come in all different colors, but I went with Carbon, a fairly neutral flavor. Also, although I do appreciate the flexibility, I didn't want to run another RGB header cable into the case to enable the lighting control on the plug itself, but it looks pretty cool anyway. But the main reason I wanted to do a build like this was for the 16 cores of power I would have access to. The first thing I did when I got everything up and running was to download Adobe Premiere and clock the export time of a recent project of mine. I copied over a timeline that I worked up on my i9-7900X system, a fairly basic 8 minute 17 second 4K project with minimal correction and only a few layers. On my main editing system that's sitting in there right now, this took 14 minutes and 18 seconds to export, and the CPU, being cooled by a Fractal Design S36, hit a toasty 82 degrees. Project Baron tore through the same task in 12 minutes and 59 seconds, with the CPU maxing out at 52C. This was actually a bit of a shock to me as when I did my initial Threadripper review at launch, it was definitively slower than its i9 counterpart, specifically in this same type of task. However, BIOS revisions and microcode updates along with better memory compatibility have significantly upped the game of the 1950X when it comes to video editing. And that makes me very happy. In some other CPU bound tasks, Project Baron continued to impress, scoring almost 3,500 in Cinebench, topping 200,000 in Realbench, and posting impressive Firestrike and Time Spy CPU only scores. But I'm sure you guys want to know how our Crossfire GPUs fared in graphics intensive applications and gaming. Well, here are those results. Crossfire is a bit of a funny thing, however, and some games really don't like seeing this configuration. For instance, every time I booted For Honor, I crashed the entire system, hence why you didn't see that benchmark here. Metro Last Light gave me some really bizarre half-crash behavior until I uninstalled and reinstalled the program, and Rise of the Tomb Raider required that I back my overclock off by 10 MHz in order to complete any runs at all. Still though, overall, I was really impressed with the gaming performance I was able to squeeze out of these GPUs. All tests were run at 4K resolution on max settings, and every title I tried climbed over the magical 60 FPS barrier 
with the exception of Ashes, which isn't a game that anybody really plays anyway. Overall, despite a few setbacks, I have to say that Project Baron is a resounding success. It looks better than I thought it might, it tears through render tasks, and it games like a champ. I think we've achieved our goal of building the best all AMD system we could in early 2018, but I'm sure it'll be obsoleted fairly soon. In which case, we'll just have to build another one. Once again, I wanna thank all of my sponsors for this project, all of whom have been awesome to work with. You can find links to Case Labs, Mod My Mods, and Source Customs, FSP, Corsair, and watercool.de down in the video description. And I encourage you guys to go check them out if you're planning this kind of project or really any type of project at all. I also wanna thank you guys for coming along on this journey with me and for showing a huge amount of enthusiasm and support for Project Baron along the way. But now that it's all done, is there anything about it that you particularly like? Anything you particularly dislike? Anything you would have changed? Let me know down below. Also, don't forget to get subscribed to the channel if you are not already. And as always, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.